Good afternoon. This is Critical Talk. I'm Professor Amina Aldean. And this evening's Critical Talk is on Muslim affairs. And we really want to get these imams' perspectives on current issues. Let me tell you who our guests are this evening. First, we have Dr. Babakar Mbang, who teaches Islamic studies and history at DePaul University's Islamic World Studies program, program and in the Religious Studies Department and in the History Department. And he also teaches Islam and politics and international relations at Loyola University here in Chicago. Dr. Mbang received his PhD in Arabic and Islamic studies from Sheikh Anta Diop University in Dakar, Senegal. And he also has degrees from various universities, including the Sorbonne Nouvelle University in Paris and Cambridge University. He's a Fulbright scholar and with residence at Loyola University. Imam Dafer al Dean is a criminal justice planner and a law enforcement assistant in in administration, corrections and juvenile justice expert, and an assistant superintendent, and he was an assistant superintendent of Southwest State Corrections Halfway House. He has been a chaplain at the Bureau of Prisons, that's the Federal Bureau, in Kansas, Oklahoma, and Illinois. And his degrees include a master's in public administration. Salam alaikum and welcome to Critical Talk which means I won't be being nice and I will be asking critical questions. This year for many Muslims was a watershed event. We had already entered a shutdown phase while in, in during a pandemic when Ramadan was due. Muslim imams yourselves and others scrambled to figure out what are we going to do? Well, oh my God, we can't go to the masjid. Oh my God, we can't have towards press. Oh my God, we can't have iftars at home. Oh my God, and oh my God, and oh my God. Uh, in some of our talks, uh, because we had a group going during Ramadan, we discussed what this might mean for the Muslim community and this slavish adherence to tradition. You want to talk to that? Don't jump at once, gentlemen. I only got 50 minutes. Let's go. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's, it's mashallah, a um, uh, pleasure to be uh, invited to this uh, forum. Um, no doubt uh, we're living in uh, unusual times. Uh, times of um, uh, shortage and lack of health and, you know, de uh, decrease in wealth, etc. But alhamdulillah, we actually have been warned in the Quran uh, regarding uh, times like this. And uh, the Quran uh, indicate uh, in such time of trying or trial, you know, or testing, uh, uh, the right thing to do is basically to actually increase our uh, resilience and uh, become uh, remain patient. So from the perspective, no doubt, I think uh, it is uh, unlike any time we have seen in, for many of us in our life, lifetime. But uh, uh, as we look back in history, we realize that there were, there were time like these, you know, for, for the history of Islam and Muslims have managed to actually go through it and even came out uh, much stronger. Imam Dhafra al Dean. Alaikum. When we look at the Quran, the um, subject, the surah that talks about the Ramadan is introduced by a ayat in the previous surah to it that focuses on contracts. And what this Ramadan has done is given us the opportunity to see how diligently and how innovatively we can come to dealing with the contract with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when everything that was normal in our tradition has been made forbidden. 
And how do you pray when you can't be next to each other? How do you have suhoor or iftar when you can't come into crowds? What do you do when you want to make prayer in the masjid, but the masjid is closed to you? What do you do when your imam is unavailable, as many imams have been through the normal channels? And what we're confronting is Muslims, um, even now after Ramadan has passed, and we look so earnestly forward to seeing one more Ramadan. How do we how do we deal with our resolution to say la ilaha illallah and to um, believe in the law and follow? And I think what we have is an opportunity to break the change of um, of um, the tr being tradition bound and fitted to the way we've always done things and find new ways of obeying Allah in these types of difficulties. Well, it's interesting because one of the things that uh, came across was we are so fettered to tradition that in the absence of them, people began to wonder if they were still Muslim. How could that be? No, definitely. I mean, I think uh, when we speak of test and test, it, it applies to, to the faith as well. Uh, as to whether or not you uh, remain resilient and basically maintain that uh, relationship you have developed with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over time, even in the face of uh, much difficulties. And I, I think uh, those difficulties are you know, something to be expected in the life of a believer. Uh, and um, in any, uh, in each one of those uh, uh, cases, yeah, it might, it might be seen as a, 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 an issue, but the other side is actually during those issues, you might turn it into an opportunity to basically uh, renew and basically reconsider your relationship with Allah in a whole new, uh, uh, in a whole new light, basically, which actually would make, your face much stronger and much more uh, basically durable, especially as you manage to go through these, you know, difficulties. I see you concurring, Imam Aldeen. Say something. Well, um, the thing is, just as my brother has said, we are so tied to certain traditions and ways of doing things, rituals even. That if we, if we allow ourselves to make a breach or a change from what we consider to be the sunnah of the Prophet wasalam, we've done something wrong and we've made the religion a test of perfection. <laughs> Did you wash your arms all the way to the elbow? Did you in washing your feet include the heels? When you enter the mess, did you come in left foot or right foot? When you stand in prayer, are your heels together? Are your pant legs pulled up? And it's gotten so that it's almost become a burden to try to enjoy the spiritual gifts of the prayer or being yeah, Muslim. Yeah, yeah. The challenge has been how do we break away from that? Because um, Allah is the one that has the, the binding fetter on us. And when the fetter of Allah does not break, whereas these other things, these other fetters, these addictions, these desires will be broken at the point of our death. So um, Allah says to us, and, and, and we were, it's reported in the hadith that if you can say la ilaha illallah with sincerity, with resolve, and follow the principles of the deen, then Allah will give you a reward. So the challenge is not to think that Allah is so inflexible that you can't innovate within the, within the bounds of, of his holy book. Well, let me chime in on something you just said. You know, I, I, have, I have a thing about the barakah chasers. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to get a reward for this. Oh, I can't do that. I won't get a reward for that. Oh, I might do that uh, so I can get, or I'll only do that after I calculate the reward, how did we get there? I can't answer that. Um, all I know is when, when, when there is a darkness of ignorance or some other negative thing that spreads, overspreads a community or an individual, it usually has this basis in 
and um, and shirk, that is believing something about Allah that is not attributable to Allah. And so what happens is the, the desire, the will, the whim of the human being gets a, takes root in the in the heart and in the mind. And before you know it, you're following that rather than that the guidance of our Lord. Uh, absolutely, and I, I agree too much of uh, brother, uh, uh, you know, Imam uh, uh, Especially if we, if we consider our faith as something of a journey, or something of a journey. And this along the line that one journey, one status in that faith uh, may actually improve, may actually get better. And for the one who actually is there accounting and counting how much blessing they have had and ultimately how much they have had, it is reflected of where they are in that journey. So, so and I think the understanding is that, well, the, you want to get to a point where your relationship with Allah is such that uh, the most important thing is only that it actually is something that you know along the line that is that boils down to what is your relationship with them. So from the perspective, it actually make even the thinking of blessing and barakah secondary. In that, it actually becomes the most important thing. So it is absolutely a level to it, a basic status in one form. So from the perspective, we see people accounting and counting how much blessing they've accumulated, um, you know, I think it is more reflective of, uh, of their uh, status or their, you know, uh, level in that experience of developing a, a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the definitions of the word for, for um, swine, I think also has a meaning of arrogance, pride, and the last one, one time, says, "Don't eat the swine. Don't, don't, don't partake of arrogance. Don't get it into your body because once it does, it becomes like um, an opioid. It becomes addictive, and, and devil getting rid of it." Well, it's it's just very interesting because uh, the same thing happened in other religious communities when they were faced with, "Oh my goodness, we can't do what we, we're we're." we're so bound to doing, right? Because almost all religious faiths, I can't think of any who don't, have a communal aspect to them. And that was shut down. In Islam, we were faced, and at some of the um, feeds I was reading with, Oh, no, we don't want to shut our message down. One African-American imam in Philadelphia, for example, refused to shut his master down. Now, I can't say what the city did, but his retort to the questions were, the people depend upon us for food. They depend upon us for child care. Without us being open... Other harms will come to play that may be worse than uh, COVID. Or, it, it, well, it was really COVID at that point. So what, what do we do in the face of that when we have communities where to follow the edict of the state puts the, the community a greater harm than the actual pandemic, it is thought. That's a, that's a mashallah, a very um, uh, interesting case that you're raising right there. But I think um, to, to look at that issue, we might, um, in our tradition, go back to some um, uh, type of uh, guidelines that some scholars have developed in the past when they actually came up with that uh, concept or the notion of what we call maqasid al-sharia, which is the, the ultimate purposes of the law or of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, of Islamic law. And if we look at one of those purposes, uh, generally those purposes, we realize that 
Islamic law is generally meant to uh, protect and preserve uh, the deen, um, the life, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the nasl, which is basically the progeny, uh, and uh, basically among many other things, such as, for example, the ayyub, which is basically the honor. And as we see here, we know that preserving life really becomes a fundamental point, a, a very important aspect, which, is, which has been basically an ultimate purpose of the law. So understanding that well, while you are trying to basically worship or basically to, you know, uh, 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 expand on a certain number of rituals, you are exposing people to danger, danger that really might be, you know, fatal or basically uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, life. You are really not, you are losing sight to the fact that, well, life is the fundamental, uh, uh, you know, aspect that actually need to be preserved, uh, especially according to our legal tradition, to our law. So uh, from the perspective, it is not uh, in line with basically that, uh, uh, you know, gradation, that type of uh, uh, priorities, prioritization that actually have been developed uh, throughout time, you know, in our tradition in that you cannot expose people to, to death just because you are, you know, seeking to, uh, you know, pursue a ritual or basically something that is uh, ultimately good for them. Because preservation of life is as fundamental as any other, or even more fundamental as any other uh, type of, uh, you know, right mm -hmm. uh, pursuit. Amen, and, and what we have, the, the other deans did not have that lost their way or lost part of their way is this ayah that Allah has given us that says, on this day have I completed my faith and have declared to you Islam as your way of life. So what we have that is unique is a perfected way of life that has guidance and signs that when we make errors, signs that bring us back to the straight path. And that is a blessing that other communities did not have until the coming of the, um, the advent of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have a perfected way of life. The challenge for us is to follow it with common sense. Well, one of the um, things that I think is very interesting, let me be a little provocative here. It's nice to have a sacred book. It's nice for imams, some of whom uh, found themselves flummoxed when um, in the middle of COVID, they couldn't talk about washing the hands before prayer. And it's, it's, it's we're so wedded. I, I want to go back to that in so many ways that were not helpful during a pandemic. People opened their Qurans and still had nervous breakdowns. People tried to listen to the khutbah on uh, online if they finally got their computer to work and they found the Zoom link and it's, oh my God, I got to download Zoom. Oh my God, I got to download this. And the frustration and the anxiety level was not guided by those who are charged with guiding us. Help me out here. I really don't get a question out of that. The question is, did some of the imams abdicate charge of guidance? Or were have. they too so anxiety riven that they couldn't get it together? I think that what you have in our community, unfortunately, with paid imams, is divided loyalties in some instances, hopefully rare instances. And there are situations that can come up where the imam wants to speak out on certain subjects, but the people who pay their salaries would prefer that the community be focused in another area. And so something that the imam may think to be critical gets delayed, if not forgotten. And mm. we get to the point of having independent imams and imams, a situation where student imams can learn and have access to people like Professor Bain and 
and uh, Dr. Amina Wadud and others, we're going to have the situation existing. Well, one of the other things that jumped out was the fact that unlike Muslim countries, here in America, you know, this wonderful capitalistic society, uh, organizations, massage, all depend on the purse of individuals. So here we find ourselves shuttered. Uh, there's no state giving, well, the state does in a number of different ways. Uh, very few massages take advantage of it because they can get uh, reduced uh, or interest-free loans. They can get uh, relief from water and sewage and other bills, but I don't know that our massages take advantage of that. So we're uh, dependent on the believer's ability and presence to give. The believer in return expects the performance, however it is, that uplifts him, gets him through the next week, etc. When that's taken away, organizations, I, I, I found myself getting 15, 20 emails a day. Give to this, give to that, give to the other. And I said, well, pretty soon I'll be out on the street because the pocket is empty here. You know, in a kind of robocall of uh, we won't survive if you don't give to us. The masjid has to pay its mortgage, uh, give to us. Uh, so have we put ourselves in an untenable situation? Um, I would conquer that, that that's a very uh, difficult situation. How do you get to a situation where a, an institution that is meant to be established for the sake of God, you know, in the Quran we say, we are, we, the Quran clearly tells us that you know, uh, uh -huh. must belong to God. Uh, yeah, and we get to a point where our mosque, our institution, our religious institution are so much dependent on basically the mood and, you know, uh, uh, the kindness of, of others by and large. It's a very mm -hmm. situation. I mean, I, 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 it would be uh, not uh, basically fair to say that it is easy to get out of that, that situation. Uh, because of you know the type of uh, system we live in and how you know we found uh, ourselves with institutions that are very much dependent on communities you know of a certain kind but by and large in you know what we could say is basically the ideal situation would be to have institutions that actually enjoy a certain you know of, of religious institution in this case that enjoy a certain level of independence and autonomy in mm -hmm. such a way that they <laughs> speak to tr the truth regardless of it, the consequences of it you know in that that actually is what serves god and that actually is the right way to actually worship as the quran you know um uh, uh, tells us so from the perspective uh, it's a you know very tricky situation to you know uh, we find ourselves in uh, and uh, i wouldn't be you know uh, <laughs> tell you that the solution is easy to that Imam i concur with the professor Oh, dude, you're not getting out of it that easily. I mean, we're, we're talking about uh, uh, the word of the day is reform. You know, and here we are. And one of, you know, if we don't learn coming out of Ramadan while in a pandemic, anything, then there's really little hope for us. My goodness. I mean, we, we found out that uh, our institution our places of worship uh, are totally depending on our showing up. Our giving is dependent on how well we like you, right? That an imam can be constrained by a board in what he says, even. Even though what he says may be far more important than what that board decides he should say. That's that it can be the situation in some instances, and I think I've seen it in one or two instances. May Allah forgive them and us. The, the challenge is how do you carry out your resolve 
when you have material concerns like mortgage, like children's uh, tuition and things like that. And I think it, address, it, it points to the need to have uh, communities so organized that you have people who know how to um, carry out the traditions, lead the rituals, and if not provide guidance, that you be able to point needy people to the guidance in the, in the Hadith or the Quran or any experience and get away from the, the situation where people are beholden to supervisors, boards, and what have you. Um, it's critical that we get back to the habit of following the example of the prophet, peace be upon him, who did not let those things deter him, even if they put the world in his right hand and, and control of everything else in his left hand, he still would say, I have to do what God wants me to do. And he was successful doing that. And he, and he well, I, I think that, that is perhaps something that we'll, we will, uh, as a Muslim community writ large, have to deal with over this summer. Um, but let me use that to segue into this. The pandemic hit, and Muslims, along with everybody else, especially after we got shuttered, began to really uh, just, uh, beside having nervous breakdowns everywhere, everybody was running around concerned, of course, about food, about illness, about having supplies at their house. Our wonderful, loving, and noisy children were sent home, and we all shed a tear. You know, the, their teachers had to figure out how to use online resources, and parents had to become teachers, although most of them had not chosen to be elementary school teachers, nor had they chosen to be daycare workers. So you had all of these things coming at the same time. One of the things that was most notable here in Chicago, can't speak for us where, was that some ethnic communities of Muslims who were uh, fortunate enough by Allah's mercy to have uh, districts of shopping and food stores and have a few, you know, some physicians in their area and some way of collecting money to help people stave off, lose, you know, the potential of losing um, utilities in their homes went into action. But they only went into action for their own ethnic community. The notion of Uma was, I hope not solidly, but swiftly buried. What's up with that? Muslims run around talking about their colorblind. They talk about, well, we have this umma of believers, this diversity until calamity hits. What's up with that? Well, we've never really had the, the, um, the full-blown umma. It's never that, I don't think there's ever been a time, except maybe when the community was very nascent, very small, and we've had a group of people of diverse backgrounds all singing and dancing to the same beat. Um, the closest they probably got to it when the prophet, peace be upon him, was turned away when he had the 10,000 pilgrims with him intending to go to Mecca and, and was forbidden to do it. I think that was the number. But that was 14 plus centuries ago. I'm talking about 2020. 2020 is 1400 years. Especially when you're in front of other religious communities talking about how wonderfully diverse you are. People even use that idiotic statement of being colorblind. They talk about the Ummah as if that's supposed to be an umbrella to hide all of the divisions and the fractures. Well, it's good spiritually for people to believe that. It doesn't cause any harm. But um, to look at any world traveler or person who has a good set of encyclopedias can see the diversity among us. So that's not- Well, I mean, I can look out and see the diversity of the colors of the crayons in my pack. But if, I, 
Uh, no, if I don't make them come together, I'll never have a picture. Well, if you assume that making us be one and united is what Allah intends. No, 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 no. I didn't say to united, but we are supposed to come to know one another, not run from one another in the time of a pandemic. Well, I would, I would just um, uh, look at it from the perspective that, well, maybe it's an unusual time. And uh, in moments of panic, people might be uh, just uh, having that instinct of, uh, you know, caring for those who are closest uh, and they're much more familiar with because, well, it is a moment when people are thinking about survival. But by and large, obviously, that's not the ideal. The ideal is to have, you know, the, uh, the uh, Ummah uh, as reflective of the diversity and basically also reflective of the solidarity that, you know, the Prophet Muhammad has shown throughout basically his uh, life. So that would be irrespective of uh, uh, ethnic background, you know, racial background or any other type of consideration. And whereby basically even uh, solidarity might go beyond the face itself. But obviously I think uh, these are unusual times when basically in a moment of crisis, uh, maybe the instinct is basically to, you know, cater for the uh, most urgent uh, need, which is basically uh, the one closest to home. But obviously that's not the ideal. That's not what, you know, uh, uh, we should be aspiring for. And one one of the things that we have to do in that regard is be accountable to ourselves. Um, there's no advantage of an Arab over a non-Arab or, or black over white or white over black, Allah tells us. Allah gives us colors. Allah has caused us to be born where we were born. What we have to be concerned about is having uh, situations come about where um, we try to forge a... a an association among different groups of Muslims that is not possible to do immediately. Like if there's one group of Muslims who are like an orphan group, um, who just coming into Islam as a group, as a ethnic group, um, and has, has negative indicators with regards to social skills, economic um, means, etc., tries to form unions with the upper class community of believers, there's going to be some conflict, there's going to be some friction beyond the, the, the traditional things, prayer, fasting, and Ramadan, and what have you. But, but you know, I, let me interrupt you there. I'm not talking about, I don't want to be your buddy. I want to eat. And if you as a Muslim got the food and the medicine, all of that stuff isn't necessary to help me out. I'm still your neighbor. But I, 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 don't, don't, I, don't I don't understand that. I don't think that's a problem in our community. Muslims help each other. Maybe we're not perfect. Let me tell you, Muslims yeah. on the north side said we got food we're willing to share, but we're not going to the south side. We're not yeah. going to the west side. Some people on what, the south what? side wish they weren't on the south side. So I can understand <laughs> that too. Well, well that, yeah. that might be that we need to have another set of uh, conversations. We step from one of the conversations we need to have is this: if your situation is a is a plight that has existed in your group over successive years, previous years, two years ago, three years ago, now and last year, and you aren't showing any type of development, you need to submit yourself to the guidance of another group to show you how to not be in that situation. Because well, that that might be true if we're only talking about one aspect. We were introduced to a pandemic, which for many of us, we had never seen a pandemic in our lifetimes. In the middle of that comes Ramadan. We stepped out of Ramadan, tried giving our toes some fresh air, and here were protests. Those protests took even some of the more affluent among us down because the protesters showing that Muslims were not their friends, rightly or wrongly, saw that 
the incidents of the killing of George Floyd happened at a Muslim establishment, right? Said, well, they're not, a, so they started burning down in various cities, Muslim establishment. So you might have shown some progress, but where was your progress? Was it only in building capital or was it building human relationships with the people upon whom you earned your living? This is critical talk. Yeah, I, I think, um, there is a very definitely truth, a lot of truth into, you know, mashallah, uh, the point you made. But we also might want to highlight, for example, the other models, you know, where we've seen uh, some in the community who actually would deploy whatever they have and share with, they did. Um, you know, mm -hmm. those who are in need. And, uh, and I think uh, using those examples are the model and, you know, uh, praising and, and, you know, uh, uh, putting it up as a, you know, uh, the thing to follow might be, you know, what actually might uh, take us forward and move us forward in the sense that what here, it actually is reflecting those ideals that actually are part of Islam. The Islam that actually is rooted in that idea of faith, common, uh, but also solidarity with the, the, the one, the people in need. So, uh, yes, no doubt the, the, there might be, you know, Action that actually are very much reflective on of uh, selfishness, but uh, uh, you know it is also important to, to you know uh, uh, say that some actually have go, uh, gone beyond really the, the the traditional way to actually share whatever they have uh, with the other in the community, which actually is very much reflective of the ideals. It also points, the situation also points to the need of Masaji to have uh, territories. Mm -hmm. In other words, the message is, you know, so here we are in the map. Mm -hmm. Let's make it our responsibility to take care of the needs in an area uh, 10 miles in diameter from around the masjid, but the masjid is the center. That I way like they that. have schools, association, churches, police agencies, government offices in their areas of concern, and, where they, and they establish liaisons with those institutions and with those neighborhoods and where they see needs or ask for help, they try to meet the need or establish the help that they can establish. Like for example, one of my pet peeves is, we send our children off to um, schools funded by other religious groups, and we just leave them there without any follow-up or, or remediation at what they're being taught. And they come home and they, and they have questions and sometimes they don't get to ask the, ask the questions at all. And so they grow with questions in mind and, and they become Twisted sometimes, or skewered by not having answers to questions. So, well, my yeah. family, I understand their their expansive responsibility to the neighborhoods beyond their doors. Well, it's also that Muslim schools need to be like some other parochial schools, especially the Catholic schools, and open their doors to students who are non-Muslims. The only way to grow a society which learns about Muslims from Muslims is to open your doors so that people are not scared of it. Teach the religions just like they do in the Catholic school along with the secular. But let me go to our current, we have a, I don't know how many minutes, um, but let me go to our current set of affairs. We have uh, what for many African-Americans has been a 100-year war. Well, it's been more. It's been a 400-year war with white power. Uh, Africans suffered uh, several hundred years of European white power. You know, we got American white power and we got European white power. Uh, for many, and I'm speaking uh, to you, uh, Professor Bang of Senegal, where that outside power was imposed. Here, we got put into its beginnings. Is there a difference? Uh, well, uh, the, I mean, I think when we look at the principle, there is, there is not much of a difference in that here we are talking about communities that really have been, uh, you know, overpowered, but basically what the Quran called mustad'afun, you know, those who actually have uh, 
uh, made to be weak, so to speak, in that they actually mm -hmm. have lost lost part of their sovereignty, part of you know their ability to decide about their political uh, destiny or their affairs by themselves. Mm -hmm. So, from the perspective here, you know, uh, it is also another uh, set of struggle, another set of you know case, which actually would require its own. Uh, solution which actually is basically to try to find or regain that uh, basically autonomy and that ability to actually uh, be, you know, uh, uh, autonomous and basically uh, free from that, you know, uh, oppression or that 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 overpowering. So obviously, you know, a, a struggle that actually is ongoing and that actually is uh, something that needed to be kept in mind as well. The issue uh, that confronts us is how do we be ourselves in, in this, this day and time in this context? And indirectly, I will respond by saying it goes back to resolve, education, setting the example, and being courageous to stand up for justice. Um, that's the challenge that confronts the Muslim communities. And I think um, it's a big enough challenge that we, it'll keep us busy for at least another decade or so. <laughs> that's, that's probably true. We have, um, uh, in talking with others, we've had several issues come to the fore. One is many, and it doesn't matter their ethnicity in the Muslim community, are fearful of their young people or even of themselves, but specifically their young people going out to join protests. They are, they know what the Quran says about justice, but they favor, well, just pray on it. Don't stand for it. Don't show yourself as a Muslim out there fighting for justice for uh, people who are oppressed. Uh, be safe, be home and pray on it. On the other hand, you have Muslim youth saying, you know, if Islam is to mean anything to me, I've got to go fight for justice. And they are showing up everywhere. I'm sure their parents are at home, again, having another kind of nervous breakdown as they see young people being beat, uh, no murders yet. And concomitantly, we have ongoing violence. Uh, in the streets of any major city. The gangs are still uh, working. They're taking advantage of the protests. They're looting. Um, folk. Uh, many in the Muslim community have said, well, this isn't really a protest. It's just an opportunity to loot. Uh, they probably have forgotten where they came from, those that utter those that kind of nonsense. But... Uh, how do you as imams work on this? How can we contextualize it so that we can see our place? Is standing for justice good talk as long as we don't act? Um, I will uh, uh, start by prefacing uh, with a hadith that actually was uh, uh, attributed to the Prophet السلام, where he was quoted as saying that whoever among you witness injustice, let him remove it with his, or fight it uh, with his hand. Or if he can, with his tongue, or if he can, with his heart. And that's the weakest uh, form of iman. And I think uh, that Hadith really details uh, different levels of basically reaction or basically way in which, for example, injustice or, you know, uh, uh, what is wrong could be um, uh, fought. Mm -hmm. And uh, depending on one's status and one's means, but also one's ability to impact. Um, no doubt, you know, praying and pr prayer is very important. Uh, there is no, you know, um, a question about that, but at some point it also is important to speak up and basically 
take a stand because uh, especially in society where those might actually uh, you know uh, 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 have an impact where basically we know that speaking up and standing up for something may actually bring the change or the difference you're seeking to uh, to create so from the perspective you know i think it all depends on one's context and when one situation in the society we're living in and how likely is basically our, our reaction to actually create one form of change or the other, especially in the face of injustice. Hey, Ma'am Aldean, last word. You got a minute and a half. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indicates to us that the goal of our living is to be able to stand before our Lord with a soul that is at complete rest, saying, I saw it, I knew it was my duty to do it, and I did it as best I could. I'm not perfect, and I go to my Lord asking for mercy and forgiveness. But the work that needs to be done to make the soul that is complete rest with itself is a challenge confronting all of us. And um, we are mercy, the greater the challenge, the greater the benefits. And we pray Allah bless us with the spiritual uh, climbing from where we may find, think our souls are now to the situation where our souls are so that when we think of the time that we're going to meet Allah, we're not fearful unduly of that time because if we are fearful of the condition of our soul before we meet Allah, the chances are we're going to not have a good a good outcome. So the spiritual challenge, we must all try to work hard towards achieving. Well, I want to thank both of you. Uh, I hope I've made you uncomfortable. I will come back to you as we move through phases where I think we need to have some internal community talk. This is Professor Amin al-Din on Critical Talk. Our guests this evening have been Imam Dhafir al-Din and Professor Mbang, who hopefully will join us again. And thank both of you. Assalamu alaikum.